Wilkin B. Bacon. He was a rising star in the early days of gospel music. He was an Oklahoman born in 1908. His grandmother was a full-blooded Choctaw, which led him to get the nickname, which would probably be politically incorrect today. He was called Chief Bacon. A little personal history. His mother died when he was 12 years old. His father did remarry, and uh, he had some siblings and step-siblings. His religious background is unclear, unknown where the family was as far as uh, their religious beliefs. In 1931, he married Mary Painter. In 1937, Wilkin was baptized into Christ, became a brother, became a Christian. As we consider where his life had been and where it went, in his youth he had an amazing baritone voice. And he began to attend various singing schools and participate in various quartets, even as a young person. As he reached his young adult years and had married, he became one of the stars of the Lone Star Quartet that was featured on KWFT Radio, Wichita Falls, Texas. He was a part of the Stamps Baxter Music Company. What those gentlemen did is they assembled various quartets to sing live on the radio as a means of selling their songbooks. At one time, there were actually 40 different Stamps Baxter quartets. There is Chief. The Lone Star Quartet became one of the most acclaimed of those Stamp Baxter quartets because of the extended time that it was locked in to WPTF radio in Raleigh, North Carolina. Truly, Wilkins was becoming a musical success. Now, just to get a little bit of history for these young people that are going, what is quartet music? Um, do you remember before the king got his start? There, there were a lot of people who had their beginnings musically in this time period, in these quartets. And it was recognized that the brother Bacon was one of those guys who was accelerating musically at that time and was obviously tremendous success in his own right. But in 1945 he left what had then just become the Stamps organization. And the reasons that he gave for leaving were because the, the grueling travel was keeping him away from his family and also because he could not participate in the local church the way he desired to. And so he made a decision to leave. He was conflicted between his musical success and his desire to, quote, do more for the Lord. A fellow gospel musician, Henry Slaughter, commented about this time in Mr. Bacon's life and said that he moved, returned to Texas, and became a minister of the gospel. He preached in Arlington, Corsicana, and Dallas, Texas, as well as Fort Worth, Arkansas, as well as Fort Worth, Arkansas, and Duncan, Oklahoma. Fort Smith, I'm sorry. Glad you can read because I can't talk. <laughs> when his performing days were over, he was still a favorite of his friend, V.E. Howard, and would come back and sing periodically on the Gospel Hour Quartet. And those of you who may have any memory of V.E. Howard know he had a radio program for years. And his line, not only on his radio program, but in his preaching was, Are you listening? Can you imagine throwing that in the middle of a sermon? Are you listening? Wilkin made his earthly exodus in 1981. And his bride Mary, just a couple of years ago, followed him at 103 years old. Why the history lesson? Well, because this brother composed some songs. All of these that are listed here are actually copyrighted. I could not find any of them. I should have called Arlene Songbook Queen there, who she probably can find some of these. 
But what I did find is that there was one that I was familiar with. And it actually was made popular because it was sung by a famous quartet called the Blackwood Brothers. And if I understood right when I researched, this song goes back to the old 78s and made it through decades of being one of their most requested songs. And the name of this song is called Can He Depend on You? With uh, my recent thrust to study, to meditate, to pray on the subjects of purpose and mission, I have found myself in my office reading and all of a sudden I'm humming. And finally I stopped long enough to figure out what it was I was humming. And it was the song, Can He Depend on You? Now I'm not sure why, but you need to know, you know how sometimes you get these, these songs in your head and you can't let it go? That was my last night. So if I seem a little tired, it's because I sang all night. But this song just kept, it kept, it kept coming back, kept repeating, it kept coming back. And finally I had to decide, okay, I guess I'm supposed to look at this song for some reason. And so I, I, I began to research some of the background and then it, then it was like, wow, this is really what God wanted me to do with this song. You know, this song has been evaluated musically and people have said, you know, first of all, it's just amazing the very clear, concise language that this song holds. The musical score is melodious, but it's not complicated. You know, there isn't anything that's, that's real pretentious about it. And one person even commented about this song, and I will agree with them because it's been doing this to me, that the power of this song was in the haunting power of the message. That it's, it, the, the message is just so profound. But what I find very interesting is the time that this song was composed. Remember I told you that he quit the Stamps organization in 1945. In 1943, he began to process what his life goal was, what his purpose was, what his sense of personal spiritual mission was all about. And you know what song he wrote during his struggle? Can he depend on you. This song was actually pinned and musically constructed when he is trying to assimilate and understand his purpose for life. What that means is it's probably a pretty good one for us to consider as well. If this was where he went with trying to ascertain his mission of life, it probably should speak to some of us. Jesus the Savior came down from above, came to bring mercy and love. Crucify him, the mob scornfully cried, so he on Calvary died. While on the cross he prayed, Father, forgive, for they know not what they do. For us he died that for him we might live. Can he depend on you? Can he deep his blessed will to do? Will you be crowned with the faithful and true? Can he depend on you? He from the grave on the third day arose, missions of man to disclose. Go preach the gospel, all who will may hear, through him be free from all fear. Bid them believe to repent and obey, walk in the newness of life. Keep the light burning to show them the way, leading from sin and strife. Can he depend on you? His blessed will to do. Will you be crowned with the faithful and true? Can he depend on you? He is preparing in heaven a home for all his faithful and own. Are you preparing to stand by his side or in that day be denied? Have you told others the story of love, showing them what they should do? These are the precepts that come from above. Can he depend on you? Can he depend on you? 
his blessed will to do. Will you be crowned with the faithful and true? Can he depend on you? The stanzas of that song seem to arrange themselves around three themes, three themes that perhaps are vital themes in understanding our life goal, life mission. The crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the coming of Christ. Paul told the Corinthians that the gospel that he had preached to them, that they had received, and the gospel in which they were standing, that they spiritually could have purpose and mission with, was a gospel that proclaimed that Jesus died, according to the scripture, that he was also raised, and that that saved them. That's the good news of this song. The fact that there is gospel. This song is the gospel in brief. It is a gospel mission of life in song. It is the purpose of believers set to music. It was the means by which Wilkin Bacon came to conclude what his life mission was. And it will also give ours some clarity. So let's consider three things. Number one, when you're trying to figure out why you're here, what you're supposed to be doing, what your life mission is, the very first principle that you need to embed in your heart is Jesus died for you. Chris talked this morning in class about how Jesus died to establish a kingdom, and truly he did. But the kingdom is made up of members, citizens, and that's what each of us are. Jesus died for you. And the first, the first stanza of this song talks about the power of Jesus coming down from above and he came to bring mercy and love. The mob, the mob cried to crucify him and they led him to Calvary. And while on the cross, as Drew mentioned, he prayed, Father, forgive. They don't know what they do. For us, he died so that for him we might live. Can he depend on you? O thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. I had to use the King James there. Isn't that a marvelous concept of our God's patience, compassion, and plenteous in mercy and truth? Read the next one with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He died for you. And while you were still helpless at the right time, God died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare to even die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in the while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Paul will write to Timothy, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason, I found mercy. Folks, I want you to get this. What Paul is saying is Jesus came to save me. I'm the foremost of sinners, but Jesus came to save me. What did that do for, for Paul's purpose, his mission in life? What will it do for ours? Those are the things that Brother Bacon thought about. And then I love the, the, the part of that first stanza that says, for us he died, that for him we might live. You know, that's, that's just repeated over and over in Scripture. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. For us he died so that we might live. For he died for all, that those who live should not no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Jesus died for us so that we could be raised, live with him. For if we die with him, we shall also live with him. And then Peter says, he bore our sins in his body on that cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He died so that we could live. Okay, now after that stanza, after the focus of Jesus died for me, then he writes this chorus. Since Jesus died for you, what kind of life are you living for him? Can he depend on you? Will your life be a demonstration of his will, of his life? And will your lifestyle bring about this eternal crown, the faithful and true crown? 
Paul will write, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. That's what that chorus says. Can he depend on me? Am I walking? The walk, the call that I've had is my purpose, my mission in keeping with that. And then Peter, after describing how all of the elements of this world, this universe, are going to be burned up with fire. Since all these things are to be destroyed, he says, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Can he depend on us? So Jesus died for us. That should do something to help us process our mission, our purpose. But he also arose. He rose for us. Jesus' suffering was on our behalf. His suffering was to bring upon him your death. He died so you could live. I thought about this point as Drew was talking this morning. How the death Jesus died, he died for me. It was my death. Jesus took on my death so that I could have the promise of life. And we're not just talking spiritual life. Jesus took on my physical death. I am not going to physically die. Oh, I'll shed this tent, but I will live. You will live. For us, he died so that we might live. It's a full life, a full life here and eternal life. The second verse says, he from the grave on the third day arose, missions of man to disclose. I wonder what he was struggling with there. Jesus died and he resurrected on the third day and the purpose that Brother Bacon found in that resurrection was, that's where my mission is disclosed. The resurrection of Christ is where my purpose lies. It's where my mission lies. It's, it's why I'm his follower. Because all of us, to quote, to quote the guy we'll listen to next Sunday, all of us are heading for that six-foot hole. But Jesus gives us a mission. Go preach the gospel. All who will may hear through him be free from all fear. Bid them believe to repent and obey. Walk in the newness of life. Keep the light glowing to show them the way leading from sin and strife. Don't you love Paul's reasoning as he goes through chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. If we don't have a resurrected Savior, folks, we've got no business here today. There's no, nothing I have to say if Jesus hasn't been raised. There's nothing for you to hear because it's all just nothing but useless. And he continues, your faith is also use, useless. And we apostles, we would be lying about God for we have said that God raised Jesus from the grave. But if that can't be true, if there's no resurrection of the dead... And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and we are still guilty of our sins. You see, our sense of mission, our sense of purpose in life is given validity by the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' physical resurrection is parallel to my own resurrection from a spiritually dead condition. A death caused by our suffering with the disease of sin. But we made a decision. We made a decision to die, to put that person away from us, to separate ourselves, which is what death is all about, to separate ourselves from that sinful person so that we could live with this resurrected person. And we did that in a watery grave, according to Scripture. Romans chapter 6 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into what? into his death. What was the purpose of his death? He died for me and so he could be resurrected. He continues, therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was, what? Raised from the dead through the glory of the Father so we too might walk in newness of life. And if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, 
that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Folks, what does that do to your life purpose? We've died to sin. We've been resurrected to walk in this newness of life. What kind of purpose does that give us? Jesus' resurrection becomes more than a promise of a life after life. It becomes a promise of a resurrection now from a spiritually dead life. A life that is attained in the present. That's the reason there's such good news of the death and the resurrection. And it needs to be told. And so Jesus would gather with his 11 on the mountaintop, and he would say, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go cause all people to learn of me, to understand that they need to be my pupil because I came and I died for them and I was resurrected for them. Go make disciples of all nations. And when you've done that, then you need to baptize them. You need to take the dead them and bury that so that they can be resurrected, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus said, this is why I came. And I want you to go, and I want you to tell that message. Folks, that's the message of mission. It's the, me it's the message that gives us purpose and mission. If you can make out the bottom of that church, it says uh, teen, YBE, Yellowstone Bible Camp, 1994. That's a 20-year-old shirt, and I still wear it once in a while. My wife cringes when I get it out. It doesn't look nearly as good as it does at the picture. I thought about wearing it today. But the unique thing is, every time I wear that, and it's usually when I'm doing yard work, so I don't look my best, I will go someplace, and every time I have that shirt on, someone will comment about that shirt. A clerk in a store, somebody I just walk by, they'll say, I like that shirt. And I say, I like what it says. Folks, that is the message of the resurrection of Jesus. Without him, life is nothing but a puzzle. It's unknown. It's uncertain. But because we have the capability of dying with Jesus and being resurrected with him, we make sense out of life. The puzzle is solved. On one occasion, there were some opponents of Paul, the Apostle Paul, and they made an accusation about, <clears throat> about the work that was going on. And they said, these men are turning the world upside down. Remember reading that, Acts chapter 17? These men are turning the world upside down. You know what, folks? That's not true. They were turning the world right side up. We live in an upside down world. But we gain a sense of mission when we understand the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ turning things right side up. And those men were going about proclaiming a message that was turning the world right side up one person at a time. One person at a time. One soul at a time. Talk about life mission. Talk about purpose. Okay, then we've got this haunting chorus again. The life puzzle makes sense only with Jesus. Can he depend on you to share that truth? Will your life illustrate the power of the righteous resurrection? Can he depend on you? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who disbelieves shall be condemned. The thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. What's our purpose? To experience that life? To show others that life? To demonstrate that life? To proclaim that life? Third verse. Jesus died. He was resurrected. And guess what? He's coming back. He's coming back. He's preparing in heaven a home for all, the faith, for all his faithful and own. Are you preparing to stand by his side or in that day be denied? Have you told others the story of love, showing them what they should do? These are the precepts that come from above. Can he depend on you? Don't you love the encouragement that Jesus offers 
the disciples in John 14. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many places, dwelling places. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what? I will come again. Why? Because I've prepared a place for you. A place for you. Are you preparing to stand by his side? On one occasion, Jesus offered a parable to il illustrate the importance of spiritual preparation. And you may not think of it in that vein right off, but I think the application of that will be fairly obvious. But what do you think, he asked. The man had two sons and came to the first son and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I will, sir, but he did not go. And he came to the second, and he said the same thing, but he answered and said, I will not. Yet he afterward regretted it and went. And then Jesus asked, which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the latter. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax gatherers and the harlots will get into the kingdom of God before you. Are you preparing? You know, everyone who decides to die to sin, to be buried with Christ, to be resurrected, to walk in that newness of life, is one of the sons that God asked to go do something. And the question for us, just like Jesus asked the Pharisees, if we said we were going to go do something and we don't do it, or if we were hesitant about it, but we grew into getting it accomplished, which of those does the will of the Father? Folks, it's important for us to process for our own spiritual selves, our sense of purpose and mission. Am I doing what I told Jesus I was going to do? Because the risk is great if I don't. If I said, I'm going to surrender to you, I'm going to give my will to you, and yet I live in stubbornness and resistance. Am I doing what I said I was going to do? And according to Jesus, the tax gatherers, the most despised people of his day, the most despised men of his day, and harlots, the most despised women of his day, will get into heaven before the one who has said, I'm going to do, and then doesn't do it. This is not... This is not a social club that you pay your dues and enter into. This is a life purpose. And our brother Bacon was struggling with his life purpose. You know, there's times I've thought, I'd rather not preach. I wish I'd have been in a quartet. He went the other direction. Lip service does not cut it as a life purpose. Starting a spiritual walk with no intention of engaging in its narrow, obedient path is not a worthy spiritual mission. Jesus is preparing, are you? And some of you will remember a time when this almost was said in every sermon. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Are we preparing? But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror and you see yourself walk away and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it.
Can he depend on you? His blessed will to do. Will you be crowned with the faithful and true? Can he depend on you? The meditations which lie beneath the writing and the composition of this song come from one who was attempting to process his life purpose, his life mission. He was wrestling with all of the occupational things that all of us wrestle with, trying to decide what would be the best for his future. He was wrestling with raising a family, just like everybody who has a family wrestles with raising a family. But what I love is that he was wrestling with his participation in his local congregation. Don't you admire that? He was wrestling with how he could not participate and be a part of that, how he lacked that. And he sat down and he penned these words. And he established his mission by realizing Jesus had died for him. He recognized also that that was not the end of it. It wasn't just the means a, a sacrifice that was made. It was a hope that was reborn. It was a resurrection. And that that resurrection became again the avenue by which he could establish his life purpose, his goals, his, his, his mission for living. And then the fact that he's coming back. He's coming back. And he's prepared a place for people who prepare for him. Can he depend on you? Isn't that a powerful question? I suspect I still won't stop humming that song. I hope some of us, some of you will start humming that song allowing it to be part of your processing, your life mission. Jesus has died for you. He was resurrected for you, and he's coming back. Have you died to yourself, buried yourself so that you could be resurrected, so that you are ready for his coming?